You're all very welcome to this talk between myself and Geraldine O'Neill. Uh, we thought we'd talk for about three hours <laughs> and then have a break and then do a slowed down version of Max Fixture's sleep. We're going to extend it over like six days. Are you okay with that? <laughs> no, I'm joking. We'll keep this brief. Um, so you're all very welcome. Um, I'm very thankful to Geraldine and to Thank Kevin you. for asking to do this talk and Alana as well. You've, that's very kind of you. Um, to talk about this amazing show and Geraldine's work. Um, we'll keep it informal. We'll talk for about 20 minutes, two of us, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then we'll ask some questions of the audience. So have your questions ready. Um, I may swear, and I apologize in advance. <laughs> I'm from Northern Ireland, we have no manners. So, you know, we're just letting loose. Um, so, Geraldine, first of all, um, I guess it, it's an obvious question to start with, but, you know, how was it for you? How was COVID? How was the experience of, you know, not having your work in a public arena, you know, being at home. And in some respects, you know, we look, I was talking to someone about this earlier on, this idea that, you know, artists were allowed to be free during COVID because it was all the pressure of taking off and you were in a studio and you could make all this work. But that's not true. That's bullshit. Because no. we know, like, you've got four kids. Mm -hmm. So that sort of takes over. But what was the experience like in terms of, you know, coming off a sort of treadmill in terms of exhibitions and making work? to sort of then have a couple of years where that wasn't feasible? Yeah, well, I suppose I make slow art anyhow. So it's it's not quite, well, if it's a treadmill, it's at a snail's pace of a treadmill because everything I do is quite slow. But being at home, like there were some wonderful times and then some not wonderful times because I suppose the anxiety and then just, I suppose, watching your kids when they haven't seen their nana or their grandma and their granddad for a long time. And you kind of realize kind of those type of bonds, those familial bonds are so important. But at the same time, you know, like great time with my youngest rescuing bees and hoverflies and feeding them spoons of sugar, even if they, sugary water, even if they didn't need them. And that kind of parallel life that's kind of slow and watchful, that was wonderful. You know? And did you embrace that slowness in a sense? I think I've always been slow like that. Um, I can, I'm very easily distracted and stuff like that. And, you know, you know, a lot of the stories that, say, my youngest son would tell me, it reminds me of myself as a child. Like the other day he said he rescued a bee in the yard and some special bee that had three stings, not just one, and he'd stung <laughs> poor old Nisha and this type, and then they got him Lucasade sport that somebody had snuck into the school and rescued, and the big drama over it. So I think there's always been slowness and then kind of fastness when you're trying to shove the kids out of the house, yeah, yeah, shovel yeah, yeah. the food into them, that kind of, and yeah. But in terms of then the daily yeah. rhythm of being an artist yeah. and a mum yeah. and everything else, I mean, how was that, how was that affected? Um, I had to get up much earlier. Um, in a practical way, because I to get you just the space in the studio, mm -hmm. I used to go at about half six, seven in the morning, come back at about ten, and then you try to get some of the kids to do work. Totally <laughs> abandoned the primary school mm -hmm. kid, but we'd go on our cycle. He learned how to cycle. We'd go around the park twice and chat. And so you just, uh, I kind of made a decision you know, especially for my youngest child, that I wasn't going to concentration schoolwork, that it was the memory that was the most important time. And he was either going to remember the time as an anxious time or a worrying time or a happy time. Yeah. So he remembers it as a happy time when he designed <clears throat> kind of birdhouses and did stuff with Hugh. And whereas the rest of the kids remember me as a nag. <laughs> yeah, to be quite frank, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know. But I guess for a lot of us, you know, and I talked to some friends about this, this yeah. idea that we look back with certain nostalgia yeah. on May 2020, because it was that amazing month of like wall to wall sunshine, mm. Mm. everything come to a complete halt. There was no traffic, there was no stress. But yet someone mm. like you, that wasn't the case. No, yeah, it was I was, just... yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Uh, I'll just say I was glad the leaving search was postponed. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Um, no, like the, the sunshine was wonderful. It was, do you know what? It was great seeing people out and enjoying the, um, just 
the world around them, having the time to enjoy it and noticing the minutiae, you know, um, that was wonderful and walking along the canal and, you know, the place was thronged with people, yeah. you know, which was great, you know. Um, it was like a, uh, reclaiming the city or something like that, you know, kind of felt it could have been a great moment where we kind of reclaimed the world, you know. That got didn't really happen. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. So tell me then about, you know, because obviously some of this work will yeah. have been made during yeah. that period and obviously yeah. the latter work's yeah. coming out in the past year or so. In terms then of how COVID or maybe maybe not COVID specifically, but that time with your family and the kids yeah. and being at home, how it's kind of filtered into the work. Well, and has, it, has it shifted in any I, sense, the yeah, work? Yeah, I think it's become more contemplative. I think... I think it's become slower, if that's possible. Um, I suppose it was just looking at the small things and it, it just seemed, I started to revisit. I'd had a, a show when I'd started to paint birds before and they were kind of donated torsos to me. Where, um, and then the show became all about the torsos and there's a show called Schlie na Fierna, which means way of truth, which is a euphemism for death in Irish. And it kind of went back to that because um, like I have a freezer full of torsos and <laughs> someone, they're in call, the cab. someone call the guard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're feathered torsos. But, um, they, um, so I started to revisit that and look at them and kind of the, like the initial premise for the show back in 2008 was that even in death there can be beauty and that we're all part of this greater thing, this kind of huge life cycle. <clears throat> And yeah, it was a bit of revisiting that, but it was slightly darker, I think, but also with its bright moments. And then like you'd see diagrams in the back or children's drawings and stuff like that. It's like I have a dictionary of these, I have a few old copies with these symbols and drawings and whatever. And um, like, it, it, like kids' drawings are just so interesting because the, it, regardless of what culture you come from, um, the symbols are the same. It's fascinating. So, like, be it like if you're one of the first peoples, wherever you're coming from the world, or if you're kind of from Western culture or whatever, you, the kids start off with the same thing. They start off with kind of scribbles that turns <clears throat> gradually into a circle. The circle will have lines out of it that forms a person or whatever. And it, it's just so I, anyhow, I have this dictionary of symbols that I go back to and kind of even say the, the background bits and the works, they're nearly like a dictionary of bits that I like to look at. It's kind of the overlooked, fragmented background bits of paintings and stuff like that. And then it's just, they, they come together organically or sometimes <clears> they don't come together that organically. You have to work at it, you're not sure what's right or wrong, but it kind of comes together. So yeah, I suppose I started working on these, you know, not really sure where I was going, but kind of collecting the canvases, working on them, taking out the birds, looking at them. I've, you know, I've got bits of drawings and bits of photocopies, placing the birds on them and rearranging stuff. And, and then just gradually it kind of, um, organically it kind of grew. So you talked, you sort of alluded there a bit to sort of historical references. Mm. You, you talk about mm. those books of symbolism. Mm. And how that kind of manifests in the mm. work, and I know from certainly some of your older work, and certainly mm. the work at the New Arts Council, is mm -hmm. this you know this work that references Renaissance painting, mm. and that's always been inherent in your work in a sense. Mm. But it feels to me, in a sense, you're sort of beginning to shift away from that. There are still moments there mm. where we can sort of recognise mm. mm. you know allegorical paintings, mm. or perhaps you know Dutch landscapes, or maybe mm. you can see, mm. there's hinted there, but they seem to be fading a bit. Is that accurate? Yeah. It's, it's hard to tell, you know, I, like, a, it, it probably is fading a bit, but I'm not sure. Like, I think, like, I've referenced Bruegel a few times, and I always think Bruegel is, like, kind of, it's like O'Connell Street in times gone by, if you know what I mean, with all the people <laughs> on it or whatever. And, um, say, Pathanir, the reason why I love Pathanir is that he just, he's such a, he, he has the 
topographical details of landscape. He's done it so well. And you can see the plants, you can recognize, you go, oh, there's a Mullins plant, there's a whatever. And you can start recognizing them. He was, I don't think he was much good at doing people, but it's just his landscapes were exquisite. So I just kind of, I suppose I could say rob, appropriate would be a better word, maybe. I kind of robbed those bits in it. And then, yeah, I, I think I respond visually to things yeah. very much as opposed to intellectually. It kind of comes together. I stick with that idea. You talked, yeah. you alluded there a bit to the, the, the structures we see, yeah. the grids or the kind of squares yeah. where it may be. And it's interesting, you know, they're all in a pastel color. They're all yeah. very bright and positive. Yeah. In what we see is, as you say, are these torsos and these mm. images of death. Mm. Is that intentional? Um, I suppose so. I always think things can be hopeful. Like you can get hope from anywhere. And um, like the, the, the title of the show, Solastalgia, it's a, it's a I heard this fellow called Glenn Albrecht talk on the radio. It's fantastic. He wrote a book called Earth Emotions. And in it, he kind of, um, he coined a load of words so that we would have language to describe what was happening, but also to give us language of hope as well, mm. that we can rebuild things. And at the same time, I was reading, um, you know, 32 words for a field. Um, and he's kind of, um, Mancon is touching into, I suppose, lost words, words that connect us to the landscape. That, um, that if you have a word for something or if you know it, you're not going to destroy it, if that makes sense. Like kids, they might squash a beetle, but they won't squash a ladybird because it's called a ladybird. And yeah, they can yeah, hold yeah. it in their hand and they're not frightened of it and, and stuff like that. Does that make sense? It does make yeah, sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I can't I mean, remember the question. No, but it's, it's yeah. more about sort of these, these structures oh, the, and yeah, grids. So, you know. Yeah, so I just think... Um, I don't know if you remember being a child, but when you're a child, you're Not so... Not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, when you're a child, you imagine, like... I, like, I do remember being a little child and having, you know, days of games and then being a teenager and I was going to fix the world or whatever. And then you get to your 20s and you realise, actually, you can't really do anything. You're just a cog. Um, but yeah, I think they're hopeful, but like some of the pictures are childlike, like, um, but some of them reference like um, there's kind of cuboid structures, but they're like, um, they're like diagrams of kind of uh, crystals, like the simplest form of a crystal is yeah, a cuboid yeah. and stuff like that. So I, I love looking at science diagrams as well. Because for me, they're, they're an interesting combination of both play structures, like mm. jungle gyms or like mm. almost like Jengas mm. in a sense. But also then they're, they're armatures, perhaps, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for a structure or they're referencing architecture. So there's quite a lot going on. Mm. So as a viewer looking at a particular work, mm -hmm. we're not quite sure what this grid is for, what it's trying to sort of evoke or what its, yeah. what its purpose is. Yeah. But so, as you said, because they're... They're all in a pastel color. They're, yeah. they're not dark, they're not sinister. No, they're not sinister. But the background on, on it might be sinister. Yeah. But they're placed on top. Like, they're the final thing to go in. So I always think, like, you know, like, there's always hope. You yeah. know? You can always kind of... You always have to look forward, yeah. you know? I don't want to get too sinister, but obviously <laughs> you talked about a, a freezer full of torsos. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And obviously the birds have been a motif in your work for a long yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. I guess my question is really about the specific birds. You know, are they, are they birds that you choose in a sense because of their colors, because of whatever breed they are? What is this, what's the sort of process around these particular birds? And also, I mean, have you got a yeah. freezer full of these? Which ones get elevated to a painting? It's actually which ones look least decrepit sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, like, the, like the, the thing about the songbirds is like birds have been traditionally mm. used in painting and in still lives, but they were always about birds of power, like a swan or whatever. And it was, it was about kind of man's domination over nature. And these are kind of the opposite. They're not about domination over nature. They're 
part of it and kind of they fell from the sky and nobody noticed them and nobody notices their demise. So kind of painting them, it's like making an icon of them. It kind of makes them precious. Or they're be even in death, like they're beautiful, you know? So yeah, no, it's not about, they, it, they don't reference particular symbolism or anything okay. like that. Yeah. Because I'm not an ornithologist, so I don't yeah. understand which breeds they are, but yeah. they must be specific breeds. Well, there's a few sparrows, there's um, a siskin, there's a flycatcher. I'm trying to look around. What else? That's a sparrow, a flycatcher. It, I was a bit short and uh, there's a robin. A bit short on samples, they talk a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. But is that, you, you talk about them being songbirds? Yeah. And is that loss of sound? Because obviously it's a painting that can't sing to you in one sense. It's a metaphorical singing that we hear. Well, um, yeah, like one of the paintings I called Machnus Bolov. Bolov means mute, and Machnus is like this great outpouring celebration, madness festival type of thing. And yeah, I suppose they, are, they have become mute, you know, but they're, song, they're the type of birds that would feed you, uh, visit your bird table, really. And what, happens to, what happened to most of them is they flew into somebody's window, but... Um, I don't get so many donations nowadays. There's just less birds around. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it is that you know, nostalgia, nostalgia yeah. as you call it, um, of thinking back to like the first lockdown. Yeah. And how we all heard birds mm. in a way that we didn't before mm. because there was no traffic. Mm. We were all at our gardens. We mm. were all at home. Mm. And just being at one with nature. And mm. that sound has now gone. I know. It's been drowned out by this return to capitalism. Mm. And this mm. back on the rat run, you just never mm. hear birds anymore. Mm. As you said, birds are dying out anyway, but it just feels that two years on, we're back to square one. We might be, but we mightn't. Like, hopefully people will have taken something with them. And yeah, it's hard to know. Like, it, it, it was kind of, um, it was great the way so many people reacted and tried to work to kind of, together against COVID. And you kind of feel like hopefully people can work together now for the climate or, you know, to just to, I suppose, to be in tune with yeah. nature or the world or something a bit more, you know? I mean, again, sticking with these smaller works, mm. I mean, what, were the scale of these determined by the subject or was it because during the lockdown, whatever materials were harder, you were at home? Because obviously we know yeah. you look for a lot of your big works. Yeah. And these are quite intimate in a sense. Was that driven yeah. by the subject matter or um, more practical? I, I actually had a load of stretcher bars that size, mm -hmm. like in a, in a practical sense. And I had the linen, so I stretched it. It's something very therapeutic about making up stretchers. You know what you're going to do. You know how many layers it takes. You know that you have to size it, let it dry, re-stretch it and all those type of things. So I had made up stretcher so so when you're making up something like it's kind of like a mindless task but it's hard work and then when you you have them ready to go so you don't mind if you don't make if you make a mistake or if it doesn't work out it's no big deal because you have a whole load kind of sized up but also when you make something small they're more like um the intensity is much bit stronger because yes. You're focusing, you've no space to make a mistake. Whereas when you're doing something like this, you know you can slap it out a little bit, you know? I doubt you slap it out, though. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, as, as, as a field painter, you know, I know that it was yeah. always much harder making small works. Yeah, it it's, is it much is... harder. This, you know, there's more room for mistakes. And yeah. If you work it out per square inch, it's a lot faster per square inch. It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about this painting as it's kind of as as he's here. Yeah. Um, and in particular, what I'm interested in is is you refer to the title of the show in this work, mm. but I'm interested in words because mm. obviously most of your titles are in Irish, mm. and I'd be curious to know what the journey is in terms of titling work, both in terms of you know where the words come from, particular words. I mean. Mm -hmm. Do the words come first? Do the paintings come first? Oh, this, and, yeah. Uh, and, the, and the decision to have this one in Irish and English? Yeah. The, the paintings come first. This was going to be called Age of Unreason 2, because I'd done, this is my son, Fiek. He's also a painter. He's 
actually just come in the door there. <laughs> As <laughs> and, if on cue. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'd done a painting with him when he was much younger called Age of Unreason. And it was first when I started getting into the whole, it was done about 2010, 2012, I can't remember, but it was when I first started getting into the whole Anthropocene thing. And he was holding a picture and I thought I'd revisit it. And this time you can see he's mopping a bucket of like, this kind of um, imaginary sea coming in on the floorboards. And so it was going to be called Age of Unreason too. And I just, it didn't fit. It's like having a baby and you think the baby's going to call, be called Fiona. And then you look at the baby and go, that's not Fiona. You know, it's, it's a bit like that. So um, anyhow, the, um, so it just didn't work. So, you know, like Fiek and I have been sharing a studio. So it's been, the best of times, and Fika, I think you'd agree, the worst of times sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so, in a way, like it just seemed to go towards solastalgia, and then it also the um, the 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 Tli Lohar. It's kind of like a, a, a it's kind of a, a it's a, an old Irish word, and it's kind of like the absence that is felt or the loneliness that is felt in Mangon references it in his book and he says that's what maybe our, ans our, our descendants will feel when we fail to pass on our language. And that refers to everything if we fail to pass on the richness and diversity of our natural world or anything, you know, a kind of richness and diversity of cultures and people and everything else like that. So it seemed to go with that. And then the, the damn thing is so big, folly had to go in there as well, you know, so it just... The three words seem to fit together, if you know what I mean. But interesting, yeah. because folly has quite a negative connotation about it. It does, but it also can be <coughs> playful. Like you have, it is negative, and all these follies were built around the country. Like people were busy building follies, and people, the, the the landlords are getting follies built when people were falling down, and they need. Glad to... things have changed. <laughs> 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 and people were falling down. So I kind of felt, you know, like I'm making all this slow painting and yet everything seems to be crashing down around me and also it's massive, you know? So, so then I, do you have yeah. like a kind of, I mean, you talked about like a, an archive of symbols. Yeah, yeah. Do you have an archive of phrases in Irish? I mean, I, say, uh, yeah. I can't speak Irish, I'm really jealous. Yeah, well, I kind, of, I kind of come back to sometimes the same ones like Jidon means shelter and Gon Jidon and... Olive is mute and there's a whole load that I, I just love and I keep trouncing them out, you know, because they mean a lot to me. Yeah. 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 They mean a lot to you as, as an Irish speaker or in terms of what their, their connotation is in terms of, because obviously Irish is a much more interesting mm. language than English. Mm. English mm. is very prescriptive in many mm. ways, whereas there's a poetry and a, and a mysticism, I guess, yeah. by Irish. Yeah. There's, there is, now I'm not a native speaker, so I don't even have anything like the richness a native speaker would have. But yeah, there are words that I kind of keep coming back to. And I, I kind of think like when, if you think of a word in Irish and then the translation to English, it's the same way as you might have an idea or a picture in your head and then the translation onto canvas that something goes missing and you get kind of something else instead, kind of the two things the two processes mirror each other. It's interesting there, you're sort of leading into my next question, which is you talked about the transition mm -hmm. and how sometimes the canvas gets lost. Mm -hmm. So we've got to look in the corner, oh, diminished yeah. vision. Yeah. Which is obviously, for those who can't see, there are a series of seven uh, CRT monitors that have been made in concrete and the screens have been painted by Geraldine. So, hmm? plaster, plaster. Sorry. Yeah. It's plaster, but they're really heavy. But they're really heavy. <laughs> but, you know, so tell me about the idea of coming off the wall and into these sculptural yeah, just, elements. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know where it came to me, but it began to stay with me for longer and longer. And I suppose um, I was just like I'm seeing I see people all the time walking through the most beautiful place like this, you know? And they're looking at this, but they're not looking at kind of everything around them. <clears throat> so um, it came to me and I discussed it with a really good friend of mine, a really good artist, and, and um, kind of the, the idea grew. So 
we just decided to make to make these to make a kind of painting installation. But the 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 mold that the TV was taken from, like the TV was found by my sister in law behind her house in a laneway. It was abandoned, thrown out. So that's what we, the mold that's what the mold was made out of. And then it was made out of um, very fine um, plaster. And um, it, it, it's also that the mold is from an obsolete technology. And it's like everything that we do, like, um, like I love spending time in Mayo and they've the Museum of Country Living there. And yeah. you go in and you see things made and you see things made that might have been made that would be passed down generations. And then, say, for example, then you have shoes and then you might have had the local shoemaker making it and it'll be passed down brothers and sisters. And then it moved to factory made and now it's like on order made. And it's like we're in this spin, this vortex that's going to, like, where is it going to end? So that's, that's kind of where the idea began to come from. And then the images on the, like my husband said, I should have called it a TV series, which has a better ring to it, but it's called Divinish vision anyhow and the images on it they were all images that I had kind of things that intrigued me that I'd actually taken on the mobile phone but I didn't know what to do with them so one of them is a compass jellyfish and last year when we were on the beach in Mayo it was like swimming in soup there were so mm. many jellyfish it's disgusting and um and that's because of overfishing mm. you know and then there were new so this was like the Beautiful that this kind of compass jellyfish, but you don't want to swim beside them. Um, and it's like an eye. Then the next one I think is um it's a seedling of um of um foxglove coming up. Um so they kind of all a lot of them just reference nature and they were all taken on my phone bar one that kind of looks a bit differently. Like the, there's the monkeys and they're looking out on their environment in the zoo and it's a diminished vision for them, I suppose. Um, there's my daughter's hand, and that was taken a few years ago, and she's holding, it's either a five-spotted burnout moth or a cinnabar moth. And you used to be able to basically collect the caterpillars, like, because the age gap between my eldest and my youngest is 13 years, you kind of see a, a huge trajectory in the way nature's going. So you used to be able to collect the uh, caterpillars by the jam jar full, and same with the moths. And last summer we couldn't find any. Like it was just, I couldn't believe it, you know? We couldn't find one. And... Um, it's interesting, because you talked a lot about some of the the, the, the process, but also yeah. the material. There's quite a lot yeah. in that to unpick. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't, we could talk all night about this. I don't want to talk too much, but... Uh, that, was the, that was the last thing to be finished, yeah. the TVs, so yeah. Do you, do you think they're painting? Are, are, are they are they sculptures? I think they're both. I think they're kind of paintings you experience in the round. It's like an installation of painting. Mm. Does that? I don't. I don't, I don't know. No, it's only because I, I yeah. noticed in the past. No, this was beginning to happen before COVID. Mm. But you see, artists who've traditionally been painters mm. are now we're moving into three dimensional objects, whether it's sculpture or ceramics mm. or objects. Mm. I'm curious to know where that process comes from. Is it a frustration that painting can't do enough by itself? Mm. That somehow you have to make them a, an object that we encounter in a different way? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Like I know when I was painting them, they were different because um, it just required a, a more, it was like I used acrylic paint on it. I, I gave it the same type of size. It, it gave a kind of, a lightness, a touch, it's, excuse me, it's the type of um, mm. painting I might do on paper, I think, but I yeah. haven't really ever worked on paper. But it just, it just seemed right. It was an idea that I didn't know I it could come to fruition. And because of my dear friend, it was able to come to fruition. But if it hadn't been for my friend, it wouldn't have come to fruition. We wouldn't even be talking about it, <laughs> if that makes sense. It does. Yeah, yeah. And what does that mean then in terms of your practice going forward? I mean, is this a potential new avenue or is this very much a one-off? I actually don't know. Like I feel, comp I always think I have no ideas in my head and I never come up with another idea. And when it comes to a show, like I just feel there's nothing left. <laughs> the tanks are empty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the tanks are empty, you know, yeah. It's, it's, it, because it, 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 
for us as an audience, it shows mm. a potential new avenue for your work mm. that perhaps, you know, we've talked about historical references mm. here in your work, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's the, the landscape mm. or whether it's the, the symbolism. Mm. You know, when I hear you talking about a more recent yeah. past, in a I, sense, and there's nostalgia yeah. there, but it's a different kind of nostalgia. Yeah, but it's still, it's beginning to feel nearly historical because I didn't see any bloody moths last summer, yeah. you know? The... Um, and like, I know when I'd come across a jellyfish as a child, that kind of, the glamour of it, because they were so rare. And now it's like, you know, you know, my son actually had a pit of doom, he called it, and he gathered them all up and put them in the pit of doom, which is <laughs> <laughs> gruesome. Yeah. Between the pit of doom and the, and the freezer full of torsos. <laughs> It sounds like a house of horrors. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I'm going to open this to the floor. Yeah. Who's got any questions? Or don't know. So the question is, you know, the themes in your work, what you kind of respond to, what kind of excites you? Yeah. I think I respond very much intuitively. So I always feel I don't know what I'm doing, number one. So um, it's often, it can be the colour, it can be just the juxtaposition of something. It, like, I always feel that, I, like I have this pr phrase in my head, analysis paralysis. If I analyze too much, I get paralyzed and I can't do anything. So if I'm really stuck, I just start to paint and it could be anything. So I think, say something like the large complex still life, that's like a reach back into work I'd done previously. That was done when I was really stuck. I couldn't think what to do, so I made an installation in the studio and rammed everything together so you have kind of weird relationships between different things that kind of make something else. So something like that happens, whereas something like the TVs, the idea came to me and then um, it just, yeah, kind of spoke to me, this idea of having these kind of beautifully made TVs that you then kind of wreck the outside but by painting an image on them basically because to be honest when I got the TVs they were, when we got brought them into the studio they were so beautiful I thought oh, I can't do anything to <laughs> yeah. these you know um, and then yeah so I, I do return to <clears throat> motifs so I'm actually not really sure how the process starts but if I get stuck I try to just work through it don't yeah and is that working process important to you in terms of like the, 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 the being a working artist the idea of going in and working at it and working at it and not just the notions that the, the sort of cliche of like waiting for the muse to arrive. I tell you, if I waited for the muse to arrive, it'd be like waiting for the 46A. It would just <laughs> never go, honest to God. Yeah. <laughs> Kieran, so the question is what inspired you when you were starting out sort of German romanticism, Dutch mm. still lives? Well, I, I suppose what inspired me was actually going to college, I had a great set of tutors, like Kerry Clark, who was here, and Kerry, like you can stretch Kerry's history back to Orpen, and then I'd make OD. I just, there were just, I'm with my friends in college, it was just such a dynamic place, and we were exposed to so much. And when I went to college first, all I knew was impressionists. And then we were just exposed to like everything from, you know, as you said, the romantics, Casper David, uh, everybody like just and it was just such a an immersion into so much and seeing so much going around exhibitions and everything that you just kind of take it in by osmosis but um what informs me now I just like looking at what's happening in you know in Ireland basically there's a really really good art being made in Ireland and around the world but and I love looking at painting you know I do love looking at painting and you know so many just good young artists like coming up they're just fantastic you know like it's a real privilege looking at other people's work and then just reading other things you know yeah yeah in terms of that idea of like being a working artist yeah. I mean, do you see as part of your work going to like exhibitions and museums to see stuff is that part of your research it is part of my research i kind of um like because my day is bracketed of course. so i kind of you know 
cycle muck down to school, get into the studio, you work, work. But because your day is bracketed, you kind of try to work through everything. And then you might have a list of shows you want to see. And sometimes I am very scatty. So sometimes I might go visit the show a week late or something like that, which doesn't work so well. But yeah, I do like to see. And if I can't see it in person, I do like to just look at it. But just only give it a certain amount of time because there's so much going on of that course, I could yeah, yeah, yeah. do it and never get into the studio as well, you yeah. know? Your observation there is around the sort of the breadth of art history. You know, we yeah. talk about the frescoes and, and the, the, the techniques that were used in frescoes in terms mm -hmm. of televisions mm -hmm. and then art history, you know, pushing and pulling in terms of these works. Mm -hmm. And how does that sort of sit with you, all that? Um, it's kind of... It, that when you, once you put a kind of diagram on a picture, you are pu pushing it back. You are pushing it, and then you have the thing that's sitting on top, and that's the thing that you look at first. And then with the TVs, like when you're talking about in conversation, like even when you hang pictures, they kind of, whichever way they're hung, they're in conversation. But with the TVs, like they're deliberately put in conversation. It's like the TVs are talking to each other, like one sits with its back to you. And that was deliberate. And like two of the TVs when I painted them, the images were just wrong, so they had to be sanded down. But it was really easy to sand, yeah. actually, you know, to get rid of those images. So you kind of feel like, you know, you can just erase things away and do them again. But it is kind of, I suppose, it's maybe political with the small p, you know, looking at the minutiae and stuff like that. And then yeah, the, the screens are on the ground, so you have to look down at them the same way as you look down at your phone. And yeah, because I guess what, what yeah. Poem is alluding to there as well is you're not a political artist, you would never no. claim to be one, no. but obviously there are hints yeah. in these about mm. what's happening in the world mm. around us right now. Mm. And it is, that's subconscious, it's not conscious to sort of capture that or document that or talk about that, is it? Kind of, it's... Gosh, I'm not sure. I kind of, like, I do feel like the way the world is going or whatever, that we're all going to have to get more into the micro rather than the macro, like micro power generation. Just take the power away from a few individuals or the kind of, the, it's like the, um, the impact of some big companies. They're nearly like colonial powers coming in. And... Um, yeah, so I suppose I've always looked at the micro bit of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, um, when do you know your painting's finished? I kind of never know, but a deadline always helps. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think um, it's, you know what, you're never quite happy. Like, I think when I make the perfect piece, I'll, I'll just give up, retire happy, <laughs> you know? But you're never quite happy. You're always striving and you're always trying for different things. And like, if when you look at your own work, I suppose look like looking at yourself in the mirror, you see all your spots and all that yeah, kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. You, you see all the flaws. Um, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes when you know it has to go, you have to make the snap decision and it stops the analysis paralysis. You know, so yeah, for yeah, this yeah, yeah. one, I had a rainbow in and it was really cake paint and, the, and I looked at it on the morning that the truck was coming. Luckily, it was delayed by two hours. <laughs> and I went, mm, scrape, scrape, scrape. And it was just a different manifestation of the rainbow went in. Just felt it had to be lighter touch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Um, it's funny, there's an artist I worked with a few years ago and they, they make moving image. Yeah. We were having the same conversation about yeah. when is the work finished? And their answer was when it's sold. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. pretty straightforward because yeah. yeah. <laughs> that thing about you know the end is tinkering, especially with this kind of work where yeah. you can tinker out of forever yeah. and ever and yeah. ever. Yeah, the, as you said, there has to be a point where it yeah. leaves the studio when it is yeah. finished. Yeah, like I painted nine TV screens, but if they'd been with me any longer, it could have been fifteen. You know, <laughs> <laughs> paint, paint. You know, um, this, this phrase of art interrupted. Yeah, in this sense of you know being taken away and coming back yeah. and things mm -hmm. changing and shifting and evolving. Mm. And yeah. You might talk to us about that. Well, the piece she was referring to, it's called Age of Unreason. And in it, it's um, Fiuk over there standing with a sheet, a, a crumpled kid's drawing. He's standing holding this drawing of, it's the ultimate refugee story. It's the biblical story 
of Holy Mary and Joseph or whatever. And he has his version and behind is a, a Patnir version. And, um, you know, there was kind of, I like patterns. I, I was a bit of a nerd at school, but I do like patterns. So there's a kind of a duality, like he has his version, the version behind, there's kind of a, a, a flower in it that's an iris that would be considered a, a symbol of Holy Mary. And then there's a weed in it, a buttercup, which I think is far nicer. And all the, there was all this type of stuff. And I had put in, um, I'd written in actually the formula for, I can't remember what it was. Oh, I can't remember what the formula was, but I, yeah, sums. Yeah, but I <laughs> deliberately made it wrong because one is time-based and one isn't time-based and you can't have it, it doesn't make sense. And then the paint, yeah, there was, yeah, it probably was. And then um, I came back to me and I went, mm, need something more. And then the cuboid went in. It just kind of needed that to make it sense and to push the background into the back yeah. so that you look at the detail at the front and the stuff painted on the surface. You know, it was the Fix version had to be more important than what was done before, or whatever, because, you know, so it, it exactly, it was interrupted, came back to me and went, mm -mm, whatever. And I don't know if I have the, I actually don't even know if I have a proper image of it with the cuboid, you know, because I probably took a photograph of it before the pink cuboid. Yeah. Well, thank you all. I think we should wrap up there and give a big round of applause to Geraldine for <laughs> a great talk. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, the show runs until the 18th of June, so be sure to tell lots of people to come and see mm. it. And we appreciate you giving up your evening to come yeah. and see us. So thank you all. And thank you so much, Eamon. Appreciate it. Um, I had the privilege of working with a number of exceptionally talented uh, students when I was working in the College of Art. And they've all gone on and done so well in their careers. But uh, the first time that Geraldine came to my class, oh. on, uh, I gave a class on still life because I wanted students to actually look at what they were painting directly. And there was one particular, um, I asked them to paint all white on white, everything white on white. And then I do, we'd all do a black on black, things like that to make them look. And uh, it was second year, fine art, and the students came in, I had, uh, 15 or 20 of them for two weeks and uh, did that. And Geraldine started up in the corner. <laughs> and I was going around some of the others and uh, I looked at her, painted on the face, <laughs> painted on the jacket, painted everywhere. And I said, holy God, what a mess. <laughs> And I looked at what you <laughs> Crystal clear observation. And she got the colour and tone and values of that small painting mm -hmm. spot. But she also got the painting. <laughs> 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 you know, I've known her for a long time. And I've watched her grow as an artist. And I can tell you, you look at these little paintings, you know, the ones with the tanks, the political comments, spot on. But then you look at the refinement of some of the <clears> paintings <throat> of the birds, exquisite. And then you look at a big painting like that, and you say, oh God, what am I doing here? Oh, that's interesting. I'll do this against the couch. Uh, I have a little man on top of a jar, whatever because you hadn't any ideas, you just mm. kept putting things together. But when you put something like that together and you look at the concept, the scale, everything, and the quality of the painting, it's just fantastic, Jeremy. Oh, thank you, Carrie. And I wish you every success in the future because you deserve all the success that you, that you have developed and will continue to paint. Uh, 
and draw with such panache and uh, real uh, diligence. Bless you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.